I've ever done this here, maybe, maybe in short snippets. Um, I, you've probably never seen anybody do what I'm about to do. Um, we're, we're, we're teaching, preaching through the book of Matthew. When you get to chapter 5, you get this explosion of truth taught by Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. So for three chapters, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, Jesus is dictated as speaking these words. Now theologians who are much smarter and much broader in knowledge than me like to think that the Matthew Chronicle of the Sermon on the Mount is a compilation of what Jesus did when He was there at the, at the Mount and some other things that He spoke throughout His ministry that Matthew took and compiled them together in his exhortation or his chronicle uh, of, of this. Luke is another section that you can look at um, to, to find the Sermon on the Mount. And Luke kind of leaves it split up. Either way, whichever camp you're in on hearing the, the Sermon on the Mount and all that's involved in that, it is Jesus dictated according to what the Bible, the canon that we have, according to what it has listed. These are red letters. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus teaching the people in His day about righteousness. Okay? So I wrestled. When, when I, I knew it was coming because of the way that I've been preaching. I, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? Because I don't want to miss out contextually on the event that was going on. And I don't want to just slice it up into a whole bunch of mini sermons because we could be here for three years preaching through this. So what I decided to do was I decided to read the entirety of chapter 5, 6, and 7 to you. Okay? In two versions. First of all, I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version, which is the version I normally preach out of. And then I'm going to circle back around and I'm going to read it to you out of the New Message or the Message Version. Again, if you don't know, I've, I've said this multiple times because I like using the message. The message version is like a commentary, if you will. Eugene Peterson was a Presbyterian pastor in, in the generation before me. He just passed a couple of years ago. Eugene Peterson took the Scripture and he created a commentary in common language for his church. It was not meant to reinterpret the Bible or change anything. What he was saying when he wrote the message is he, he was saying, look at the Scripture and then here is my take, church, on how it can be read, read or spoken in common language that we know in the last couple of generations. So don't get all wigged out when I read 5, 6, and 7 in the message version. Just understand, that's not an interpretation of the Bible. It's just taking it and putting it in common language. That's why I'm reading it in two different versions. The New King James and then the message. So what is your deal to do today? What I ask you to do today is engage with the Word. Not with me necessarily. You're going to hear my voice, but engage with the Word. So instead of sitting back like we normally do, which is fine, there's no stones being thrown here online or watching, instead of sitting back and listening to me deliver the message and all the theatrics that I normally give, okay, don't, don't, don't focus in on that. I want you to engage on what's on the screen because we're going to show the Scriptures here. You're going to hear my voice. I really would like for you to get a device or your Bible out so that you personally engage all right, with what's being said. And then I want you to take notes. All right? So I've got pieces of paper on the altars up here. I'm not asking you to take notes because we're going to take a test later. That's not it. What I'm asking you to do is the Holy Spirit. I've already prayed and asked Him to do this. But I'm asking you to listen to the Holy Spirit. And when He says verse blah, 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 blah to you, just write down real quick chapter 5, verse 16. And then commit to me that later this week or this afternoon or whatever, you're going to go back and you're going to listen to it again. You're going to read it. You're going to dig into it. You're going to study it a little bit. Okay? Imagine this. We're about to just sit and listen to the Word of God. Not somebody's interpretation and exhortation of it. We're going to sit. We're going to listen to Jesus speak. And then I believe the Holy Spirit is going to do a work in you and draw you and show you. I guarantee, because I've already read it multiple times, I guarantee something's going to be said in these Scriptures that's going to hit you and you're going to go, 
and you're going to need to go back and you're going to need to look through it. Now, why am I doing this? Here's why. We have got to, as a church, I think as the big C church, we have got to take the Bible and the Word of the Lord serious. I hope you're doing your Bible reading, okay? If you haven't, that's cool. Catch up. You can catch up. Got plenty of time. Got to the end of the year to catch up, but catch up. But I think we need to learn how to engage the Word on a weekly basis in this platform so that we're getting deeper understanding. In other words, hear it, even when I preach it later on or somebody else preaches it from here, but then take it home and think and ponder and study it, okay? So important. We need to get away from just hearing the snippets and the feel-goodisms. We need to get the Word inside of us, right? So that's kind of the plan today. Now, what I'm going to do after today is for the next couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, I'm going to come back to 5, 6, and 7, and I'm going to highlight just a few things in sermon form, in message form, that I think the Lord would have us to listen to as a congregation then I'm going to move forward. So for, for the next two to three weeks, I want us just to land in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, and as a congregation, just eat it up. Now, uh, the guys in the back, they're going to put this, the words on the screen. I hope you've got your pen ready. Read along with me, all right? Stay with me, if you will. I will go slow at times. I might even just... Ah. I hope I can contain myself and not preach. My goal is to sit here and read and let you listen. I may comment here or there. All right, so we're starting in chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and he was seated with his disciples, came to him, and they, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who, persecute, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now pause there for a moment. I know some of you with ADHD and ADD and all those other DDDs we have are thinking at this point, wow, this is going to get boring. No. No. Push through those things, guys. Push through them with me. Stay engaged. Remember, this is Jesus speaking. And let's imagine for a few moments He's sitting with us right now and He's doing the teaching. He's doing it. I know Jesus. But stay with me. Verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of, these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar 
And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will, be, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Verse 27, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, verse 31, It has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is His footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make your hair white or black, but let your yes be yes." And your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. You have heard heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do even, do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you, what do, you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Chapter 6. Take a breath. Everybody take a breath. Whew. I'll give you just a few moments to look back over that chapter 5 and make sure you got little notations on what you want. Just a few seconds. Just a few seconds. Jesus can really teach, can't He? If you're having trouble with understanding or you're thinking, wow, what is that? That's the point. Is that truly what that means? For example, if you're thinking, divorce? Oh my. You might want to go back and study that a little bit or ask an elder, ask a pastor. All right? That loving your enemies, man, that person, yeah, you might want to highlight that. You might want to pray through that this week. Cool. Good, good. Let the Word of God engage your soul. Let the Holy Spirit work inside of you. You engage in this process. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as a hypocrite, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Surely, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly." Verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Surely, I say to you, they have their reward. 
But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. You probably need to highlight that whole thing. Verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Verse 19, don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, verse 25, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you would put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more valuable or more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? I'm going to read that one again. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed, so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear for all these things the Gentiles seek? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these will be added or shall be added to you. Everybody say amen. Amen. (laughs) Therefore, verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I'll pause a moment. Highlight. It's good stuff. Are all my attention deficit folks okay? Are y'all okay? I'm fine. I, I have that problem. I'm fine. I hope you're okay. I know by now you probably know every cobweb that's around and every every I know you know that I've got on a shirt that's too tight. I know you see me up here fidgeting. I, I I'm with you, okay, but re-engage. Let's go again. Okay, let's go again. Chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? (sighs) 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not grieve what is holy to the, to the dogs. Do not, do not give, excuse me. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks find, finds, and him to him who, no, who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them also. For this is the law and the prophets. Listen to these verses. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare before them or to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He wraps it up. This is his kind of conclusion. He ends a sermon better than any preacher I know. Verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So it was when Jesus ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His teachings For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Isn't that cool? There is so much there. Y'all could tell how I could preach through that for, for months and years. Okay, And you know, the great thing about the Word when we read it like this and the Holy Spirit gets involved, you've got sermons right now in your heads. Sermons that you can preach to yourself in the mirror. Sermons that if you are called or you are a teacher, you can tell people. You've heard things for people that you, uh uh-huh, I know Jesus talking about so-and-so, right? And I know you get you got deeper revelation of the Word. I know, and that's what's so great about it. I welcome that. I want you to dwell in that and think about that and let God just, not not that you dwell in the condemning of others, but you, you, you dwell in the fact that the Holy Spirit made that alive in you for different reasons. Amen? Are you all okay? Never seen this done before, have you? It's good stuff, though. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back, and I'm going to read chapter 5, 6, and 7 from the message version. Again, remember what I said about Eugene Peterson, okay? Um, if you have the message version on your phone... You can look that up, and, 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 uh, or your device, if you've got a device, maybe you've got a Bible, I don't know. You can read through. The guys in the back are going to put the message version up here. You're going to hear what Jesus was saying in the New Testament, New King James Version translation, and then you're going to hear it in 
um, our language. If you'll give me a second to take a drink of water, I'd appreciate it. Jumping back to chapter 5. <clears throat> I'll pause at a few moments in this so that you can get um, the verses because the verses don't match, match up real good um, in this commentary translation. All right, here we go. Chapter 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw His ministry drawing huge crowds, He climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions this. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God in his rule. You're blessed when you feel, when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. These are good, by the way. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being full of care or careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get inside when you excuse me you're blessed when you get your inside world your mind and heart put right then you can see God in the outside world You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight that's when you've discovered who you really are and your place in God's family You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution the persecution drives you deeper into the kingdom of God. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time put you down, every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me, again Jesus speaking. What it means, what it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even for though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you're in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Let me tell you while you were here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your, you've lost your usefulness and you will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. A public, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open your house. Be generous with your lives. Be open... By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Excuse me, I need to take a little break. <clears throat> Isn't that good? Didn't that put a little bit of the, 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 the salt and light, a new kind of spin on it? Didn't it do that? I need to take a short break. Excuse me. My mind is getting busy. Okay. All right, let's go. Verse 17. Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the Scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together. Put it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you'll only tri trivialize yourself. 
Take it seriously. Show the way for others, and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. This gets good right here. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I tell you that anyone who is so much as angry with his brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at your sister, and you're on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. Wow! There's a whole deeper stuff. There's some deep stuff going on there. But it's good to see the sinful fruit on the, on the surface and think, oh my goodness. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your pe- place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get, a, you won't get out without a stiff fine. Now, contextually, in Jesus' day, this is how the law and the church, the, the, the gatherings of the Jewish community, this is how they dealt with these type of things. Murder was a big deal. You don't kill with the sword. And Jesus came back and said, hey, I'm going to take this a little deeper. There is murder in the heart. Work your stuff out with your enemies, with those who are against you. Now, how does that correlate to us in our culture? Here it is. If you're in this room and you're thinking, ah, I've got an alt against this person, or I've got an alt against that person, or I'm offended It is our obligation to forgive them inside of our hearts first and foremost. Amen. And if we have an opportunity, we should go to them and we should work it out, especially if those brothers and sisters in Christ are with us and around us. There should be no offense within the body of Jesus Christ because we have the forgiveness of Christ toward us And it should come through us to others. Amen. I imagine that most all of us, including me, struggle the most with Jesus teaching that type of stuff. Let me tell you, if you are and you do, grab a hold of it, the Scripture, grab a hold of Jesus, and let the Holy Spirit work in your heart to get deep into your soul where that is. Amen? All right, here we go. Chapter 27. You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue by simply staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easy than it really is. Easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better (laughs) Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally. Give her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she has already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure.
Now look, I ain't said nothing but read you the Word of God. (laughs) What you're starting to see, what you're starting to feel, is how we as a people and a culture take the Scripture either out of context or try to get deeper in the context to justify some of our sinfulness in the hearts that we have. You're starting to sense, you're starting to feel the mucky, murky, mucky, muddy, murky, muddy waters that are this life and this culture, this flesh. And I'm reading you the Word of God. So what are you supposed to do with it? The same thing I've been saying the whole time. You take it. You hear it. You think, ah. Then you pray into it. Then you seek wise counsel about it from the Holy Spirit and from others that you can trust who know the Word and who are men and women of God. If you Wikipedia Google search Scripture, you're going to hear all kinds of crazy mess. The power of God and the Spirit of God is in His faithful people and it's in His Word. That's why you you have a piece of paper. Write it down. The Word of God is intended to rightly divide our souls. And it needs to do that. Allow it. Verse 33. And don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of pious talk, saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying, God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Verse 38. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice a servant's a servant life. No more tit for that. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. My God, help me. Thank you, Isaac. Somebody else. Amen. Help help us all, God. Verse 43, you're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. Again, Jesus speaking. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives His best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. Grow up. Your kingdom subjects. You are. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Chapter 6. Be especially careful when you are trying to do good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action. I'm sure the play actors, I call them, treating prayer meetings in street corner like a stage, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it quietly and obtrusively. That's the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. And when you come before God, don't turn into that theatrical production either, into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show of their prayers, hoping for stardom, 
Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense His grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who, pray, who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you were dealing with. He knows better than, he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can very simply pray like this. I love it. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a bla- you are a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. God, that's good. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to, to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. Golly, look at that. Peterson, man, just nails it. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. That could be applied to a lot of other things too. If you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing, He'll reward you well. I'm going to say we because it's the same old mess that we deal with in the flesh. We, in Jesus' day, were trying to act religious so we could get people to like us for our religion. We're doing it now too. Oh, I'm fasting. They would in that day come out, I'm I'm, 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 I'm not bathing. (laughs) In our day, oh man. I've really been seeking the Lord. Do it, but don't tell me about it. Sorry, I I should not have said that. (laughs) Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worst or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasures in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. Verse 24, I'll read it again. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving God, one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If If you decide for God, living a life of God worship... It follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God 
and you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never pimp, primp. I hope they don't pimp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They never primp or shop. I've done pretty good, y'all. I've done pretty decent. I've done pretty good. <clears throat> They've never prim they never primp or shop. But have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think He'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do His best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way He works fuss over these things. But don't you know both God and how He works? Steep your life in God reality. God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. That's good, isn't it? And the last chapter. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Every spouse in the house, turn to your wife. Look up here, baby. I'm sorry. Every man who wants to live should have done that. And I don't mean to pick on you single people, but not calling that out. Don't we have a tendency to do that, right? Don't do it. Don't pick, up, pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults. Unless you want it to come back. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Ain't that the truth? Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt. This guy was in my house the last few days. <laughs> it's this whole traveling road show mentality all over again, playing a hol holier than thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Golly. Don't be flipped with the sacred. Banter and silliness give God no Give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans in trying to be relevant. You're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a count cat and mouse, hide and seek game we're in. If your child asks for bread, do you trick him with a sand salt? Wow, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be even better? Here's a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with sure, with sure fire, easy going formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practiced sincerity. Chances are they are they are out to rip you off some way or other. Don't be impressed with charisma. 
Look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are, grow, are going to be chopped down and burned. And I'll just say a huge amen. Knowing the correct password, saying master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment. Thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preach the message. We bash the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. God, that's sobering. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who builds his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. When the storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teachings like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to their religion teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. And that was, my friends, the best preaching I've ever done. I wasn't expecting an amen, but I'll take it. <laughs> it absolutely was the best. Would you stand to your feet, please? Isaac, if you'll play for just a second. So there was that, that chapter... 7 verse 24, this was, this was the place I wanted to land and I wanted everybody to leave on. Um, put it back up there again, Caden. These words, these words I speak to you. There you go. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words. Words to build on. If you work these into your life by the power of God's Spirit, by the knowledge of His Word, by Jesus doing it, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on the solid rock. So the challenge is now you've heard it today and you've got it in your hands. You've got access to every bit of this. There's no notes here. I just simply read you the Word of God. Take it home. Process it. Digest it. Work it into your everyday life. And then for the next few weeks, pray for me as we learn deeper some parts of this. Would you pray for one another? Would you pray for me? Um, during these difficult times that the Word of God may be applicable and we would apply it to our lives. Come on, let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word. Father, I am specifically thankful today for Jesus and His teaching. For the way that He sat down in a culture and time and taught us your ways, and your word. And I'm thankful for men like Matthew of old who was able to be there and it was your wisdom and your providence to write down those words so that thousands of years later, Father, you are speaking to us through those same words again. What a miracle. More than that, you put people on earth like Eugene Peterson to make it sound like what we can relate to. And even further than that, here we are in 2021 
And Father, we read Your Word knowing that Jesus is the Word made flesh, that He came, that He saved us by His blood, that He was raised from the dead, and that He has filled us with His Spirit. He's given us His Spirit. We live in His nature now. Now, in 2021, we read these words that You spoke, and the Holy Spirit comes alive inside of us. And we feel the faith of the Almighty God in our souls that say, that's the truth. That's the Word. And the witness of Matthew and the witness of the Spirit comes alive inside of us. And we hear that you are the true teacher, the real preacher, the one we follow. We love you and we thank you for it. And in this room, right here and right now, we simply read words written on paper, but it comes alive by the power of the Holy Ghost, and we are challenged and we're changed. Thank you for that miracle. Not a single person in here gets a glory, but we're all common, and we come to it the same. Thank you for that miracle. Father, we love you for that, and we needed that today. Now I pray for us, that we will take this Word, you, we would take you, the Word of God, we would take you, the Word made flesh, Jesus, and by the Spirit, it's so important that I say that, God, we need your Spirit. We need a denial of self, and we we need to come alive to who you are, your nature and your Spirit, that we would come alive to it and that you would work it into our daily lives. Now, your people have listened to your Word today. Father, you have made it alive to them. You have... You you have allowed them to write it down. You have given them specific things to think about and ponder on. I pray, Lord, you complete that work. And God, give them ability to walk in it with you in the next few days. I know another scripture, Father, where you say, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Father, hide this word in our hearts in the next few weeks. And may these be times where we know you have met with us and we've been changed because of interaction with your word and your spirit. Now, for the rest of the day today, Father, I pray your blessings on your people. I pray, Lord, that you help us to have fellowship and good times while we're here and then we're safe going home. We want you to get all glory for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.